we'll get started. First of all, welcome everyone. It's a great to see such a nice crowd out tonight. We're really excited for our evening's program. I'm Susan Richmond, president of the Robert Creeley Foundation. And I just want to say that what makes this reading different from all of the other readings um, in our literary community is the word community, because these events are possible because of you out in the audience, the tireless efforts of our fans to spread the word, the generous contributions of business leaders and public institutions in cash and in kind, including Concord's Colonial Inn, which is donating our poets lodging and breakfast, the Acton Memorial Library Foundation, Enterprise Bank of Acton, Old Frog Pond Farm and Studio in Harvard, and I see representatives from Old Frog Pond Farm out in the audience tonight, uh, the Acton, Boxborough, Chelmsford, Concord, and Littleton local cultural councils, the faculty and students of the Acton, Boxborough Regional High School, and all of our contributors and sponsors who appear in the program, with special thanks to the Georgia Whitney Memorial Trust Fund, our gold level sponsor this year. Please patronize these businesses and thank these individuals. We thank them from the bottom of our hearts. Um, I also want to say a special thank you to the foundation members, particularly Jean D'Amico and Marsha Rich, whose attention to last minute detail is the reason that you're all able to be here tonight. Um, they have done so much in the last couple of days. Um, I also want to thank our graduating student members of the foundation, Hannah Karp and Gotham Chitteru. Um, they have done a phenomenal job this year including bringing to us this fantastic musical group, Eat, Play, Love. I don't know if they're still in the house, but I would like to give them a rousing <laughs> hand of applause. And finally, thanks to Brendan Hearn at the high school, who's responsible for all of our logistics and AV. We couldn't do it without him. So we have a very exciting program tonight, a nationally renowned poet who served as Poet Laureate for the state of New York and has garnered three decades of awards, beginning with the selection of her first book for the LeVon Younger Poets Prize. We also have two incredible student poets selected from a field of more than 100 applicants from 65 schools throughout Massachusetts for our 11th annual Helen Creeley Student Poetry Prize. As always, we'd like to invite you in the audience to consider joining the foundation, signing up to help with publicity or making a contribution so we can continue to hold these events and keep them free and accessible to all. Please see the students who are taking donations or stop at the information table as you leave. And as I said before, we have the beautiful broadside of Marie Howe's poem, The Copper Beach, for purchase at the book sales table. And if you are one of the lucky raffle winners. Um, so don't forget to fill out that form. There's still gonna be time. We're gonna make that drawing at the end of the program. And now um, I'd like to introduce Terry House, our vice president and one of the co-directors of the Helen Creeley Student Poetry Prize. And she'll tell you about this year's broadside competition and raffle drawing and introduce our Helen Creeley Student Poetry Prize winners. Welcome, can you hear me? Okay. So the Robert Creeley Foundation sponsors two student competitions each year. The first one, you've been watching, the Broadside Project at Acton Boxborough Regional High School. It began in 2009 when art students in Ms. Mackay's portfolio classes submitted designs inspired by the poems of that year's Robert Creeley Award winner, Sonia Sanchez. For the 2017 competition, students in Ms. Green's portfolio classes collaborated with students in Mrs. Fishkin's, Ms. Murphy Lassard's, and Mr. Chorba's English classes to select and illustrate poems of this year's Robert Creeley Award winner, Marie Howe. Ms. Howe personally chose Fiona Dolan's winning broadside design of her poem, The Copper Beach. Now in its 11th year, the Helen Creeley Student Poetry Prize competition honors Robert Creeley's beloved older sister, his much admired first mentor, Helen. As a high school student in Acton, Helen won national prizes for her poetry and her spirit lives on in our competition. It is open to all Massachusetts high school students. 
and this year's winning poets topped a field of over a hundred entrants. I'd like to introduce the first reader tonight, Emma Crockford. She is a junior at Rising Tide Charter Public School in Plymouth, and she is the founder and editor of her school's newspaper. Her poems have appeared in the Emerson Review, Brown University's The Round, Gravel Parallax, and Liminality Magazine. So, Emma? We have a certificate, a gift card, and you have a copy of Robert Creeley's Selected Poems. Thank you so much. Um, hi, um, I'd like to thank everyone involved with the Robert Creeley Foundation for this wonderful opportunity. Um, before I start, so this is the first real funeral. You grieved for the skin we found stuck to the sidewalk, not knowing the garden snakes were only molting. Like boys running towards the water, their elbows popping out of t-shirt sleeves. In dress-up clothes on basement steps, we held mass like priests. Wearing father's ties, you wrote eulogies for everything that tasted like tragedy. We learned to mourn on Saturday mornings, in bare feet with dirty hands, planting tulip bulbs upside down in mother's garden. I am buttoning my black coat to my chin, standing in the kitchen, feeling your silence on my skin. I am at the corner of your grief, and you are somewhere in the middle of its country, in the middle of his absence, small again. At night, I wake up, and I am close enough for a minute to hear the voice, 16 and calling to the shore, the night they raced to the water. I dig my feet into the cold sand and watch them spitting salt water from their cheeks. Children with sunburns peeling down their backs. Fresh skin scrubbed raw with salt water underneath. And my second poem, Lake Erie. The new house straightens its spine in the heat, while I make beds with sharper corners, snapping Cape Ann into these sheets that have never seen the coast. Standing in the middle of the driveway, your eyes are on the stream of cars sliding west. You shuffle closer to me, the burnt pads of your feet balanced on the bridges of my own. This is nothing like our ocean. I remind you again, but you cannot find where the water ends and that is enough for you. It is too hot here some days to do anything but wait. So I teach you patience by putting your dirty feet in sneakers and prayer by cutting your wild hair short, giving it to the birds. For days, your worried palms find phantom waves at the nape of your neck. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Our next student winner and reader is Claudia Inglesis. Claudia is a junior at Buckingham Brown and Nichols School in Cambridge. She enjoys writing prose poetry, training in classical ballet, meeting James Joyce, and baking multitudes of chocolate chip cookies, mm, not for us, uh, for her school's writers group. Claudia, where's my friend? There she is. And Claudia, I have a certificate, a book, and a gift card. Thank you. 
Thank you all for coming. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I'm sorry I didn't bake you any cookies. <laughs> Sophia told me she was going to jump out of a tree at eight years old, craving the euphoria of flying, delusional from the hot sun, and sure that gravity had its exceptions, I joined her. I broke my ankle twice, but Sophia, she found her clarity in the open air. Sophia needed to fly, so she danced like her feet had wings. And I loved Sophia because she smelled like honeysuckle and her skin felt warm and she made me feel like I was floating. We frolicked through ballet class together, grasping hands, waving arms, and tickling the floor with our toes. And Sophia and I used to eat. We stuffed snacks in our coats and crawled into corners, tearing the bags open and dumping sugar into our mouths. We stumbled giddily into ballet class with pop bellies like drunken men. Our teacher slapped Sophia's pop belly with her cane and sneered. I can see those pancakes you had for breakfast. Why don't you suck in a little bit? Sophia's chest ballooned out, her ribs pressed against her pale pink leotard, her abdomen carved into her body, her face grew red as she held her breath. I didn't see her exhale. Sophia traded our snacks for ice water and our two mile runs for 10. We raced through frigid trails, cracking ice with our sneakers, collapsing into snowdrifts. Sophia took my icy hand and laid it on her stomach so I could feel her skin shiver. She told me she felt empty. I had never loved someone who was empty. Sophia stopped dancing to fly. She danced for the valleys between her ribs, the indentations of her collarbones, the light that shone between her thighs. She danced with her eyes closed, covered every mirror in her house, showered in the dark. I stopped catching Sophia dancing in her underwear and started catching her skipping lunch, hiding food in napkins, shoving toothbrushes down her throat. Sophia shattered every light, slammed every door, made a spectacle of removing herself from my life. She evaporated in front of me and I grasped desperately to keep her on the ground because I didn't know how to love someone who let herself float away. Sophia failed her auditions, failed mirrors, failed scales, failed eating, failed looking at herself, failed at not tearing herself to shreds. The shreds of Sophia floated around me like ash above embers. I picked shreds out of the air for her to see. I showed her the tutus that flew behind her body like a cape, showed her the swings that took us so high our toes pricked holes in the sky, showed her the tree we jumped out of. I showed Sophia the shreds and she saw herself. So, it is my great pleasure to introduce our featured reader tonight. Um, I fell in love with the poetry of Marie Howe the first time I heard it. It was also the first time that I heard her read. Someone told me that I should get over to the Concord Library and hear this amazing poet, and they were absolutely right. Um, the only thing that was as mesmerizing as her poems was the Q&A that followed. She gave each question her full emotional attention with answers that were thoughtful and personal and heartfelt. What the Living Do, uh, Howe's second book had recently come out and after the reading I couldn't wait to buy my copy, this book. From the very first poem, The Boy, um, I was riveted. Boston Globe reviewer Liz Rosenberg wrote, What the Living Do is a deeply beautiful book with the fierce galloping pace of a great novel. This is a book that many of us will need and be grateful to have. Need and be grateful to have, I think that describes so much of Marie Howe's poetry. I lived those pages over and over and I'm still living them. Howe's first book, The Good Thief, was selected by Stanley Kunitz for the Levon Younger Poets Prize and by Margaret Atwood for the National Poetry Se Ser Series. Her collection, The Kingdom of Ordinary Time, was a finalist for the LA Times Book Prize. 
And of this collection, playwright Eve Ensler said, these poems make me gasp. Each one a revelation, a lifetime, a domestic galaxy. And today we are very fortunate to be able to practically debut Marie's, Marie Howe's eagerly awaited fourth collection, Magdalene. We have copies of all three of these books for sale at the table. This is one of the first opportunities you're able to buy these books um, publicly and certainly to get it signed by Marie. So please stop by the table and, and snap them up. Marie Howe's other accomplishments are many. From 2012 to 2014, she served as Poet Laureate of the State of New York. She's received fellowships from the National Endowment of the Arts, the Guggenheim Foundation, and the Bunting Institute, Institute at Ratcliffe College. And in 2015, she received the Poetry Fellowship from the Academy of American Poets, an honor that recognizes distinguished poetic achievement. The Academy Chancellor Arthur Say described Howe's poems as remarkable, for their focused, intense, and haunting lyricism. Poems that are acclaimed for writing through loss with verve, and their ability to find the miraculous in the ordinary and transform quotidian incidents into enduring revelation. In addition to four volumes of poetry, Marie Howe is the co-editor of a book of essays in the company of My Solitude, American Writing from the AIDS Pandemic, and her poems have appeared in The New Yorker, The Atlantic, Poetry, Plowshares, and many, many other journals. I could go on and on, but for those of you who have never been to a Marie Howe reading, I don't want you to have to wait a minute longer to experience what I did. Um, I guess more than 10 years ago, we were talking about that. And if you have heard Marie read before, well, you know exactly what I mean. It's my great honor and pleasure, and I assure you that Robert Creeley himself would be equally honored and pleased to present the 17th annual Robert Creeley Award to Marie Howe. Please welcome Marie. Wow, it's so great to be here. Um, thank you so much. Um, I'm kind of, I'm sort of overwhelmed. There, I um, have seen a lot of my, some old friends have surprised me. And um, hearing these two very powerful women writers has just been such an honor. Um, two wonderfully nasty women. <laughs> Yay. Um, I'm just gonna put this here. Um, Robert Creeley, you know, well, a couple of things. Look at all of you. It's so amazing that we're all here to hear poetry. You know, po let's, just, let's just celebrate poetry for a minute. Uh, um, poetry, <clears throat> you know, these two young women have just reminded us poetry, well, here's what Creeley said. Creeley said, I write to realize the world as one who has come to live in it, to give testament. I write to move in words a human delight. I write when no other act is possible. Asked about good poems, Creeley, who had written in the introduction to Best American Poetry 2002, that the poem is the place we are finally safe in where understanding is not a requirement. You don't have to know why. Being there is the one requirement. Responded, if one only wrote good poems, what a dreary world it would be. <laughs> but let's just say that again, though, this wonderful line about that place we are finally safe in, right? That then what you two gave us, you know, you created this space we were safe in right, that it's human, and the complexity of being human, the full complexity of being human can be there. And it also comes from an interiority that each of you has developed within herself. And this interiority is what we hold sacred, right, because nobody can buy it. It can't be a commodity. Even in this radically capitalistic system, 
we each of us, each of us has a space within us that nobody can ever buy. No one can own it, no one can rent it. You know, um, it's priceless to us because it is worth nothing in this culture. And poetry is worth nothing in this culture. And so it's priceless, you know, because we want people to steal our poems. We want them to learn our poems be, by heart, right? We want them to copy it down and hand it to someone else, you know? And so it somehow moves through the system of buying and selling invisibly, but essentially because we turn to poetry when we are most needing it. And um, you both reminded me of that tonight. I really want to thank you. Um, Robert Creeley, uh, you know, wrote poems that were so lean and mean, so lean and mean. I remember thinking, whoa, can you do that? You know, um, you know, the famous one. So I said to my friend John, because I'm always talking, John, I said, which was not his name, the darkness surrounds us. What can we do against it? Or else shall we, and why not, buy a goddamn big car? Drive, he said, for Christ's sake, look out where you're going. That was a poem. I mean, it was, it was, it was revolutionary to me. You know, like you can do that. What? And and I know that later in my life, when people began to walk and talk in my poems, you know, that just walk through talking, that Creeley had something to do with that. You know, and why not buy a goddamn big car, drive? He said, for Christ's sake, look out where you're going. And I just have to read one more, the gorgeous, the gorgeous rain, poem called The Rain. I'm sure you've heard it a zillion times because everybody loves it so much. The rain. All night the sound had come back again and again falls this quite persistent rain. What am I to myself that must be remembered, insisted upon so often? Is it that Never the ease, even the hardness of rain falling will have for me something other than this, something not so insistent. Am I to be locked in this final uneasiness? Love, if you love me, lie next to me. Be for me like rain, the getting out of the tiredness, the fatuousness, the semi-lust of intentional indifference. Be wet with a decent happiness. And so he retrieves Eros, too, right? And gives it its honor. Beautiful. Um, OK. Are those musicians still here? Where, uh, really, are you? Did they leave? Wow. They were amazing. So um, I'm just going to read, I'm just going to kind of run, run through, uh, whoops. I want to say something about contests, too. You notice I'm like lecturing here, I'm sorry. Um, is very, very difficult. There really is no competition in art. Let's just make that clear. Everybody works her own corridor. There's nobody in competition with you. And so choosing the broadsides was impossible. I mean, they are so amazing. And we can start that slideshow again. So amazing. And I imagine choosing the poets was impossible because every single one was terrific. And um, I, I asked, begged, please, do I have to, I can't, and, and I had to, but it was very, very difficult. And um, I really want to congratulate everyone who made one of those. Uh, they're hilarious, witty, profound, beautiful. Um, the boy. For all the men in the audience who lived through the time of life when all across America, at dining room tables, fathers and sons were arguing about the length of hair. <laughs> you remember? The boy. 
My older brother is walking down the sidewalk into the suburban summer night. White t-shirt, blue jeans, to the field at the end of the street. Hangers hideout, the boys called it. An undeveloped plot, a pit overgrown with weeds, some old furniture thrown down there, and some metal hangers clinking in the trees like wind chimes. He's running away from home because our father wants to cut his hair. And in two more days, our father will convince me to go to him. You know where he is and talk to him. No reprisals. He promised. A small parade of kids in feet pajamas will accompany me. Their voices like the first peepers in spring. And my brother will walk ahead of us home and my father will shave his head bald. And my brother will not speak to anyone the next month. Not a word, not pass the milk, nothing. What happened in our house taught my brothers how to leave, how to walk down a sidewalk without looking back. I was the girl. What happened taught me to follow him, whoever he was, calling and calling his name. <clears throat> so here's one for the girls. For your presidency, madam. <laughs> Practicing. I want to write a love poem for the girls I kissed in seventh grade. A song for what we did on the floor in the basement of somebody's parents' house. A hymn for what we didn't say but thought. That feels good or I like that. When we learned how to open each other's mouths, how to move our tongues to make somebody moan, we called it practicing. And one was the boy, and we paired off maybe six or eight girls and <clears throat> turned out the lights and kissed and kissed until we were stoned on kisses and lifted our nightgowns or let the straps drop. And now you be the boy. Concrete floor, sleeping bag, or couch. Playroom, game room, train room, laundry. Linda's basement was like a boat with booths and portholes instead of windows. Gloria's father had a bar downstairs with stools that spun, plush carpeting. We kissed each other's throats, and we left marks, and never spoke of it. Upstairs, outdoors, in daylight, not once. We did it, and it was practicing and slept sprawled so our as uh, sprawled so our legs still locked or crossed a hand still lost in someone's hair and we grew up and hardly mentioned who the first kiss really was a girl like us still sticky with the moisturizer we had shared in the bathroom i want to write a song for that thick silence in the dark and the first pure thrill of unreluctant desire just before we made ourselves stop. <clears throat> um, Um, <clears throat> one of, uh, uh, I, have, I have a little daughter. She's not little anymore. She's 17. How did that happen? Um, but uh, uh, so she's sort of through this Kingdom of Ordinary Time book. And I, one, of, uh, one of the poems people wrote, made broadsides of was of this poem, Hurry. And so I'd like to read it for all of those in the room who have trouble slowing down. Anybody here like that? 
I was talking to a taxi driver <clears throat> yesterday in New York. He's from Russia. And I said, how do you like it here? He said, oh, it's terrible. It's so hard to live in New York. I mean, I, I like it, but it's very hard. The economy, da da. I said, well, what's it like in Russia? He said, oh, it's so much better. Nobody here knows how to relax. I'm like, really? You can relax in Russia? He goes, yeah. <laughs> and I said, you know, an hour away from here, people are relaxing. And he said, really? It's just New York? I said, yeah, generally. <laughs> mm. It's so interesting. So here we go, hurry. We stop at the dry cleaners and the grocery store and the gas station and the green market and hurry up, honey, I say. Hurry, hurry, as she runs along two or three steps behind me, her blue jacket unzipped and her socks rolled down. Where do I want her to hurry to? To her grave? To mine? Where one day she might stand all grown? Today, when all the errands are finally done, I say to her, honey, I'm sorry I keep saying hurry. You walk ahead of me. You be the mother. And hurry up, she says over her shoulder, looking back at me laughing. Hurry up now, darling, she says. Hurry, hurry, taking the house keys from my hands. <laughs> True story. <laughs> so um, this new book is called Magdalene, and I grew up in, in the Irish Catholic uh, household, you know, eight siblings, 100 first cousins, um, no kidding, um, and, uh, you know, mass all the time. And I, I, and I loved the stories of the Old and the New Testament. They are archetypical to me. Um, some people grow up with the Greek myths or, you know, superheroes, but for me it was Mary and Joseph and the sheep and the shepherds and Noah and... Uh, Moses, and, um, and of course the women, you know, Eve, Mary, and Mary Magdalene. Um, and of course, as in all things, patriarchy had its way with those women too, um, because there was Mary, the mother of God, and Magdalene, who has, was depicted for centuries as a sinner, a repentant sinner, often as a prostitute, um, somehow the idea was that she had create, uh, committed some sensual sin. Um, so um, this book is, uh, the voice in this book is, is trying to heal that split, um, which so many of us suffer from, not just women, but, you know, sacred, secular, sexual, uh, what's the other side? What's the other side of sexual? Sacred, secular, sexual, pardon me? Yeah, but let's make it alliterative. <laughs> I can't, I had it a minute ago, what was it? Well, you know what I mean. A sinner, uh, you know, virgin whore. Remember that one? Yeah, you're with me, right? Um, do young people feel that way? I wonder if you do. Maybe we can talk about that, you, you guys, you know. Um, if you feel that split, is there still like a class slut, you know, and, a, and then and that's what we always had growing up, you know? Like you were either this or that, this or that. Um, pardon me? Did somebody answer? <laughs> I want you to answer though when we're done, okay? Um, so anyway, this, this, this is an attempt for, as a, well, what I love about Magdalene and what I loved about the saints I read about growing up was that they were women who were the subjects of their own life. They were trying to make their way through their bewilderment, trying to find meaning in life, searching, um, and, and by doing so, trying to heal that, that split that, that culture had imposed on them. It's a lot of language. Let's just start. Before the beginning. Was I ever virgin? Did someone touch me before I could speak? Who had me? before I knew I was an I. So that I wanted that touch again and again without knowing who or why or from whence it came.
how the story started. I was driven toward desire by desire, believing that the fulfillment of that desire was an end. There was no end. Others might have looked into the future and seen a shape inside the coming years, a house, a child, a man who might be a help. I saw his back bent over what he was working on, the back of his neck, how he stood in his sneakers and wanted to eat him. How could I see another person? I mean, who he was, apart from me, apart from that. One of the things we do know about Mary Magdalene from the Gospel of Luke is that she had been possessed by demons, and by seven demons, and that they were expelled from her. Is there anybody in this room who has any demons? I love that laugh of yours. Um, so this is Magdalene and the seven devils, and she's trying to explain to us what those demons were like for her. The first was that I was very busy. The second, I was different from you. Whatever happened to you could not happen to me, not like that. The third, I worried. The fourth, envy, disguised as compassion. The fifth was that I refused to consider the quality of life of the aphid. The aphid disgusted me. But I couldn't stop thinking about it. The mosquito, too, its face. And the ant, its bifurcated body. Okay, the first was that I was so busy. The second, that I might make the wrong choice because I had decided to take that plane that day, that flight before noon, so as to arrive early, and I shouldn't have wanted that. The third was that if I walked past a certain place on the street, the house would blow up. The fourth was that I was made of guts and blood with a thin layer of skin lightly thrown over the whole thing. The fifth was that the dead seemed more alive to me than the living. The sixth, if I touched my right arm, I had to touch my left arm. And if I touched the left arm a little harder than I'd first touched the right, then I had to retouch the left and then touch the right again so it would be even. The seventh, I knew I was breathing the expelled breath of everything that was alive and I couldn't stand it. I wanted a sieve, a mask, a, I hate this word, a cheesecloth, to breathe through that would trap it. Whatever was inside everyone else that entered me when I breathed in. No, that was the first one. The second was that I was so busy, I had no time. How had this happened? How had our lives gotten like this? The third was that I couldn't eat food if I really saw it distinct and separate from me in a bowl or on a plate. Okay. The first was that I could never get to the end of the list. <laughs> the second was that the laundry was never finally done. And the third was that no one knew me, although they thought they did, and that if people thought of me as little as I thought of them, then what was love? The fourth was that I didn't belong to anyone. I wouldn't allow myself to belong to anyone. The fifth was that I knew none of us could ever know what we didn't know. The sixth was that I projected onto others what I myself was feeling. The seventh, well, the seventh was the way my mother looked when she was dying. The sound she made, her mouth wrenched to the right and cupped open so as to take in as much air. The gurgling sound, so loud, we had to speak louder to hear each other over it, and that I couldn't stop hearing it. Years later, 
grocery shopping, crossing the street. No, not the sound. It was her body's hunger, finally evident what our mother had hidden all her life. For months, I dreamt of knuckle bones and roots, the slabs of sidewalk pushed up like crooked teeth by what grew underneath. The underneath. That was the first devil. It was always with me. And that I didn't think you, if I told you, would understand any of this. Here's a little poem called Dualism. Is that bad, the girl? says when someone tells a story or when we see an accident on the road or lately when just about anything happens. Well, I say, not good, not bad. But is it bad, she says again, sensing my small hesitation. Well, not good, I say, and that seals it. Um, this book begins with an epigraph from the Gospel of Thomas, one of the Gnostic Gospels that were discovered you know, in the late 20th century. And it's a wonderful quote. Um, his disciples said to Jesus, when will, when will you be visible to us and when will we see you? And he said, when you undress and are not ashamed. So here's a poem called The Affliction. It's a little crowded up here. You know the, mm -mm. let me see one more drink. The Affliction. When I walked across a room, I saw myself walking, as if I were someone else. When I picked up a fork, when I pulled off a dress, as if I were in a movie. It's what I thought you saw when you looked at me. So when I looked at you, I didn't see you. I saw the me I thought you saw as if I were someone else. I called that outside, watching. Well, I didn't call it anything when it happened all the time. But one morning, after I had stopped taking the pills, standing in the kitchen for one second, I was inside, looking out. Then I popped back outside and saw myself looking. Would it happen again? It did. A few days later, my friend Wendy was pulling on her winter coat, standing by the kitchen door, and suddenly I was inside, and I saw her. I looked out from my own eyes, and I saw her eyes, blue, gray, transparent, and inside them, Wendy herself. Then I was outside again. And Wendy was saying, bye-bye, see you soon, as if nothing had happened. She hadn't noticed. She hadn't known that I'd been there for maybe 40 seconds and that then I was gone. She hadn't noticed that I hadn't been there for months, years, the entire time she had known me. I needn't have been embarrassed to have been there in those seconds. She had not noticed the difference. This happened on and off for weeks. And then I was looking at my old friend John. Suddenly I was in, and I saw him, and he, and this was almost unbearable, he saw me see him, and I saw him see me. He said something like, you're going to be okay now, or it's been difficult, hasn't it? But what he said mattered only a little. 
we met in our mutual gaze in between a third place I had not yet been. And I think I'll finish with a poem called One Day. Um, and I want to thank everyone so much for your warm welcome and for this award and for being here with you all and for being with these beautiful poets and with the beautiful artists and, and those musicians who are now invisible but still here. <coughs> One day. One day, the patterned carpet, the folding chairs, the woman in the blue suit by the door examining her split ends, all of it will go on without me. I'll have disappeared as easily as a coin under lake water and few to notice the difference, a coin dropping into the darkening. And West 4th Street, the sesame noodles that taste like too much peanut butter lowered into the small white paper carton, all of it will go on and on. And the eye that caused me so much trouble, nowhere, or grit thrown into the garden, or into the sticky bodies of several worms, or just gone, stopped, like the Middle Ages, like the coin Whitman carried in his pocket all the way to that basement bar on Broadway that isn't there anymore. Oh, to be in Walt Whitman's pocket on a cold winter day, to feel his large, warm hand slide in and out and in again, to be taken hold of by Walt Whitman, to be exchanged, to be spent for something somebody wanted and drank and found delicious. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marie. It was wonderful, inspiring reading. Uh, we do have some time for some questions. So we have a couple of mics set up. And if you have a question, if you would approach the mic so we can catch your question um, recorded. And uh, we will go back and forth from mic to mic. So please don't hesitate. Or you could ask a question of Emma or Claudia. <laughs> Hello. Good day. Um, I heard that you have met a uh, Russian taxi driver, and I got curious if you have ever like taken um, a liking to foreign um, poets or something. Kind of. I heard that you were um, that you said that Creeley was something, someone who inspired you. So I'm really interested in if you have been interested in other foreign poets and something. Yep, like who inspired you. <laughs> I am, I'm from Russia myself, so I got really curious. Yeah, I got really, I was surprised. And I must say, it's not better. <laughs> I am, I'm serious. Yeah. They are busy, but with things that they shouldn't do. <laughs> ah, yeah. <laughs> We were just saying, you know Joseph Brodsky? Do you know if you heard of Joseph Brodsky? I've heard of him. So yeah, we were talking, we were talking about, we were talking about what, what are we talking about? The Russian <laughs> poets. Uh, Inspirate, like. Um, uh, it, it, there, it's innumerable. I mean, there's, it's impossible to say all the poets. Every poet I've ever read has inspired me and influenced me. I mean, Whitman is a huge influence, you know. I love Robert Frost, Emily Dickinson. I'm just thinking about dead people now. Um, <laughs> but, you know, Rilke, uh, uh, just so many, John Keats, um, so many poets. But there are so many contemporary poets, too, who have had a tremendous influence on me. I mean, Creeley, it really wasn't that kind of ease, that semi, that seeming ca casualness of his speech, a kind of American way of talking. 
was, was you know, that lean, minimal thing was gorgeous, you know. Um, but we could, each of us, name a name here tonight. There's so many wonderful writers, and they've all, everyone I've read has influenced me. It's great to hear you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Hi, um, when you're writing, I just do uh, pencils or pens, and what kind of paper do you like to use? <laughs> You're joking. <laughs> Do you write with a pen? What? Do you write with a pen? Well, sometimes, but I have a black Murado Warrior pencil here that I those like very much. Those are great. I love those. I use them all. Mm. I'm I'm just a messy girl. I don't have a I don't have a pattern. Um, and and for the last 15 years, I've been a mother. So, and I teach full time and I travel. So, I used to be very severe. As some people here will remember, I wrote every day, didn't talk to anybody, but it's not like that anymore. I mean, I write, if something comes to me, I write it out on my phone, on a tablet, on a piece of paper. I write on a computer, you know. I rewrite and rewrite and rewrite on a computer. Probably a lot of people do now. Whoa, William. <laughs> Hi, that was wonderful, thank you. Um, how important is the last line of a poem, and how do you know when a poem is done? You write and you rewrite. I mean, do you wait for that little, you know, that's that little thing to happen inside you, that interiority or something that you were talking about? Or, I mean, how do you know when it's done? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, you know, my, my friends tell me, you know, a lot of it is that. But truly, I mean, I'll just say, if, truly, I, it, to be honest, I've read it over a million times. And um, most, most times, if a, if, so, if a poem has, I don't think I have anything to say. I think a poem has something to say to me. So often it's when the poem speaks and it's done uh, speaking. Um, but, but there's rhythm and there's silence and there's all sorts of things, you know, that, um, that make something feel finished. And then some poems don't want to be finished. They just want to stop, you know. Stanley Kunitz, we talked in the car today, was my dear friend and teacher. And for many, many years, we had a joke that if you showed any poem to Stanley, he'd say, cut off the ending. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine, cut off the ending. Um, because we were young and we were explaining, you know. Mm -hmm. And now I realize that I have nothing to say, so I just wait t till the poem stops talking. Cause the, but, but there's that, there used to be that desire to kind of keep going. So, you know, what, what I mean by that is blah, blah. Um, but that's, that's pretty gone, almost gone now. I don't know. I don't, I don't think the ending <coughs> is separate from the beginning or from the middle. You know, it feels like a... Well, you don't write them in order. Pardon me? Probably don't write them in order. I do. You do. Yeah, for me, it's a fabric. Well, Oscar's here. We have an old friend. I remember Stuart used to say, I I'm writing a poem, and I have the first two stanzas, and I just don't know yet what the third. I'm like, what are you talking about? I didn't understand that. For me, it's a body. There's, it's a whole body, you know, and it, it has a beginning, a middle, and end, and, and the body itself is organic to itself, and, and I can, you can sort of feel it energetically. Or like Keats, you know, the, when he's doing the odes to Autumn, he's moving sections around, you know, um, and changing them. I've done that, I guess, a little bit, but mostly it feels like a, a fabric for me. But everyone's different. I mean, there's so many writers in the room. I, I, you know, I'm sure people, are, there's many answers here as there are people. Most readers assume that poems are true, and they also assume that poems are autobiographical. Do you have any concerns about revealing yourself and how do you decide what to reveal and what to keep private and perhaps safer? Well, um, I understand your question. I think that poems are, you know, a poem is, a, is an artifice. You know, it's not journalism. I mean, it is an artifice, it's a made thing. And so, of course, there's autobiographical elements that go into it, um, as there is in any art. 
Um, but I don't feel, um, maybe the older I get to, I don't, I don't feel too worried about that. Um, when I was younger, you know, I come from a big family, you know, people would get upset um, because there were things I was writing about that, that touched on uh, other things. But, but finally, um, I don't, I think that it, the poem is in some ways impersonal. I, 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 don't, I don't really matter. Um, I mean, I really mean that. I don't really matter. Okay. Um, that, that the poem has its own life and its own vitality and its own reason for being that's beyond me most of the time. And so now there are the poems I've written that, um, for example, there are some things I would write that I wouldn't, uh, well, I'm thinking of prose more. I would write that involve my daughter that I wouldn't publish until she's much older and she can tell me how she feels about that. But a poem feels different to me. Um, but also, like to write and with the mask of Magdalene, you know, was quite liberating. Because, and that's one of the great reasons to write inside an archetype, too. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Hi. Um, I was wondering how you've gone about writing about really heavy and powerful emotional material, like especially in what the living do, while still taking care of yourself um, and not becoming overwhelmed by it. What was the last thing you said? Without what? Not becoming overwhelmed by it. Mm -hmm. Well, what the living do, you mean the poems about my brother John yeah. who died? Mm -hmm. Well, that was really easy because I love John and their love poems and it was a great way to be with him after he was dead, you know. Um, so it didn't hurt me at all. It had already happened, right? right. I mean, he lived with AIDS and died mm -hmm. from AIDS and that happened. Um, he went blind, he couldn't walk, you know, he weighed 90 pounds. And, but as John would say, one of the last things he said to me was, Marie, this is not a tragedy. I'm a happy man. Um, and he was. So, you know, there were love poems. It was a joy to be able, I couldn't do it for many, many months. I couldn't do anything, but John's still dead, John's dead, John's still dead. Still, you know, you, if you've known and loved someone who's died, you know what that's like. Still dead. You know, a month later, still dead. Are you kidding me? And then like a year goes by, still dead? What? You know, time for this to be over. But then, then the great thing about art, everybody suffers. Everybody's known loneliness, unbearable loneliness. Everybody's known unbearable joy, right? Everybody here. Everybody is human. But, but, but when you write, you can make something of it. And you can make something out of it. Uh, for good or for bad, you can still make something out of it. And that is a miracle to me, you know, that you can, you can do something with it. Um, and in this case, it was, you know, letting John talk and walk around again. And so it was a joy, actually. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hi, uh, I'm a senior at my local high school, which, which is this high school. Um, <laughs> That was a moment there. Right. <laughs> right. Um, so I'm taking this class in my high school called Senior Project. Um, and my project focuses on trying to uh, get high school students interested in poetry because um, I believe that, you know, not only just writing poetry or reading poetry, but just immersing yourself in poetry in general can yield a lot of life skills that we can take you know, as high schoolers into the real world. Um, so I just wanted to know what you thought and what would you tell someone who was on the fence about, you know, learning more about poetry or trying to write poetry? Well, what do you do? I'm sorry? What do you do? What? You're the one who's trying to do it. What, what do you do? How For do you get someone interested in poetry? Well, what I'm doing is uh, right now I'm running a few poetry workshops at my high school in um, a few of the English classes. Um, right now we're mainly working on reciting poetry yeah. because, you know, writing poetry might be a little harder to do when, you're there, when they're just starting out. But um, right now we're working on um, getting students to, you know, find new versions of themselves when they step into the shoes of these poets. Um, That's because, a great idea. you know, what's happening with, you know, a lot of these students I've known for a very long time is that they become really different people when they, you know, recite these really, you know, 
intellectual and deep um, poems. And I thought that was really interesting, and they've learned a lot more about it in the process. You know, we don't try to get people to like music, do we? No, they just like it. Yeah. <laughs> or, or we say, listen to this, right? Right. Remember, you just say, come in here, you've got to listen to this. Lie down, close your eyes, listen, don't even talk, listen to this, right? We can do that. Listen to this. The thing you just got, you just described, reminds me, there's a guy in my school, Jeffrey McDaniel, a wonderful poet, and he does a thing every year called the Dead Poet Slam, and he has, he, 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 he gets people, to, young people together, and they choose poets who are dead, and they learn the poems by heart, and they perform them. And they're amazing, they're really amazing. They do Shakespeare, they do Anne Sexton, they do Sylvia Plath, they do Emily Dickinson, they do all sorts of things, but they really, uh, it's great. But I think mostly just keep reading, you know, sharing poems you love with people, and then they begin to hear why you love it, you know. It's great you're doing it. Thank you. It's really great, I'm so happy you're doing this here. Thank you, I'll be sure to tell them what you said. <laughs> <laughs> He's joking, right? <laughs> he what? <gasps> you booked those those musicians? Oh yeah, I just. I just <laughs> Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Um. So I was wondering two different things. First of all, I was wondering if you ever experiment with different kinds of poetry and also when you sort of got interested in poetry. Um, yes, I, 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 do, I do experiment with different forms, you mean? You mean different forms? Sometimes I'll just give myself exercises like to write a sonnet and I throw it away, I mean, it's not good, but just to kind of practice the way people practice the piano, you know? I mean, if there are people who play instruments here, I mean, you have to practice, right? So, or, or I'll try to translate from a language I don't know using a dictionary or, you know, I'll, I'll just do stuff like that. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll just try to learn, broaden, um, or, I'll, or, I'll, or I'll steal from other poets, so, I mean. Really, a lot of it is that you say, "How did how did she do that?" You know, and then try to figure it out, and then do it myself. Um, but I started quite late. I mean, I, I wrote things, but I didn't I didn't really know about writing poetry. I, I wrote stuff for my family, my brothers and sisters, when I was growing up. But I didn't know that you could be a living poet. <laughs> I didn't. And then we were talking, William and I were talking, I went up to Dartmouth one summer as a high school, I was teaching high school. I was teaching high school in Townsend, Massachusetts. North, no, yes, North Middlesex Regional High School. And I, well, we could talk long and long about that, but um, uh, and I, I love teaching high school, but I, I went up and got this little fellowship up at Dartmouth for high school teachers. and. We could take courses, and there was a writing workshop, and I thought, I'd never taken one, and I thought, well, I'll just sit in on the first class. And we went around the room, and everyone said why they were there, and I said, I don't know if I'm staying, I'm just sitting in to see what it's like. And then the teacher, when it came around to her, she said, well, I'm writing my spiritual autobiography. And I said, who are you? <laughs> I mean, I'd grown up reading St. Teresa and St. Augustine, you know, I was like, who are you to write your spiritual autobiography? I meant it respectfully. I really did, but I did exclaim it out loud. <laughs> because I didn't, I couldn't believe it that someone said this, you know, in modern life. And she said, I'm a lyric poet. And I said, I want to do that. And she said, then stay. <laughs> and I did. And everything changed, you know. It was a miracle. It was, really. Together, oh, so it's, <laughs> it's all set. We're two for one. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> we're uh, colleagues at uh, Lexington High School. We teach English, um, and you are a huge part of our curriculum. And it's just sort of kismet that you're here 
and we just finished it, and we told them about it. Uh, they're not here, but they're never anywhere, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's fine, it's fine. So um, we were just sort of wondering what sort of advice you have for young writers, period. <laughs> You're teaching at Lexington? Yeah. Wow. He's only a few years old, younger than me. It's weird. Yeah, that kid that was, I don't know, he looked really young. Who? The kid that was right before. I know. I was like, I, I was like are you my age? No, he's younger. Well, yeah. you, young writers, you mean you? No. I mean, mean, I'll take it, but <laughs> for them. For them. Yeah. Oh, you mean the people you're teaching? Yeah. Well, the same thing we were talking about with the music, right? Just read the greatest poems you know out loud to them and have them learn them by heart. Just, just bring in really great stuff. I mean, it's intoxicating. What, it, the real stuff. You know, there's a great, do you know this? Um, you probably know this last school, The Staying Alive, you know, Neil Astley. Do you know that? Do you have that? Does somebody know what that is? You know, isn't that a great anthology? There's some really, really great anthologies that are really, really, uh, what is it about that anthology? It's so juicy, you know, it's just so good. It's called Staying Alive. It's British, but, it's, but you can get it. Or just, just, there is? But just the main thing is just bring in poems from everything from, you know, Emily, my life had stood a loaded gun, you know, um, to, to somebody writing now and just bring in really great, great stuff. High school people taught me how to teach poetry to them because I would bring in like kind of safe poems, you know, and they'd be like, uh, and, then, and, then, and then they'd say, you know, give us, and then I would read something that I thought was kind of inappropriate and they loved it. <laughs> Bring in inappropriate poems. <laughs> I think that's the answer. Because nothing's you. inappropriate that's human, right? We no longer have to be ashamed. There we go. Okay, thank you.